Well, welcome to Talking Science, uh, the new weekly show focusing on science and space news from everywhere in the cosmos. And joining me once again is Dr. Brad Tucker from Canberra. Brad, thanks for coming back. Yeah, no worries. Now, it's the poop show today. We've got a couple <laughs> of uh, stinky stories to dive straight into. Uh, the first one is 50-year-old human waste on the moon. I didn't know about this one. Yeah, so look, it, it was an interesting one that popped up, and, and it seems there's so many, I think, questions that are asked about this. Um, so firstly, <laughs> obviously, when the Apollo astronauts went there and they boldly went where only a few people had gone before, um, <laughs> you wear space diapers, space nappies, essentially. And weight is very precious in space, especially on the return trip. So they couldn't carry any extra weight back with them. So that means all the stuff they had to deal with, they left behind on the surface. So there are these essentially kind of white, trash baggy, nappy looking things underneath the lunar rovers. Um, that is where the astronauts went in space. <laughs> I suppose given the choice between moon rocks and uh, and human waste, exactly, moon rocks right. were a bit more important. That's right, you know. Uh, but now there is a reason that people want to go back and look at it. And so, you know, we talk a lot about can things survive the harshness of space, especially on the moon or elsewhere. And the only thing that we know that's been living like that is bacteria and human feces. Uh, human feces is about 50% bacteria or something like that. And so that means the stuff they left behind contain, you know, 50% living organisms, even though we don't consider bacteria in, you know, like our type of life, but it is a, a life form. And so there's a bit, an interesting question that if people are going back to the moon, should they collect this? Because they can then see how long, or even if this is still, did this bacteria survive the harshness of space, the radiation, um, the fluctuations in temperature, the, the harsh conditions? Can Earth organisms, fairly normal organisms, not these things we call extremophiles, live in essentially the vacuum of space? And so people want to go collect 50-year-old astronaut poop. <laughs> not me, other people. <laughs> other people with gloves and, and long pokey sticks. That's right. Well, they did conduct an experiment on Apollo 16, um, the microbial ecology evaluation device, which was on the outside of the lunar lander. They survived for a couple of days. So is it such a stretch to think that um, I, I know a couple of days to a couple of decades are, you know, they're, they're, they're bigger time units, but uh, is it a stretch to sort of expect these things to survive? No, and I think that's it. It's, I mean, the question is, they really like to know how long they did. Is it weeks? Is it months? Or did a few survive, you know, and evolve and mutate and are still alive there? The, I, I think it's very a worthwhile question, you know, and it seems kind of absurd on the, on the, on the surface, but as you said, we have done this a little bit and there are signs that it can. And this is important if we think about two reasons. One, what else can survive in space when we look for it, other types of life, but also when we send probes into space and we think about our earth contaminants on it, how likely is it that they will survive and potentially contaminate a place, say like Europa or Titan, very you know, these moons of Jupiter and Saturn that we want to go and explore. We don't want to pollute it or contaminate it with their own Earth organisms. So it's a very worthwhile question, as, as, as strange as it may be. I guess the other thing too, Brad, is that um, it could almost be the starting blocks. Uh, I mean, Matt Damon did it in The Martian, so could it be, you know, our, our first lunar settlers using the poop to uh, to grow some crops? Look, you know, hey, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bit out there, and we all like to watch Matt Damon eat poop potatoes, but, um, you know, <laughs> China had that little bubble on the rover they put on the far side of the moon earlier this year and, and put cotton seeds and potato seeds and silkworms to create a little environment. And that survived, albeit in a contained environment, for about 14, 15 days. Uh, and, but, you know, those are a lot more sensitive than bacteria. So I think it's, you know, it's a very interesting idea. And I, and I hope someone does do it because it's important for us to know these things. Again, I'm just glad it's not going to be me. <laughs> Hopefully not. Maybe maybe that's punishment, I guess, if you do something wrong, is you get sent to uh, go collect astronaut poop. The, the poop scooper. That's a job nobody wants. But, I mean, look, Brad, very quickly, uh, would you, if you were given the opportunity to go to the moon but you had to collect the poo, would you do it? I'm not even that interested in going to the moon in general. Oh, right, okay. So, and it's just I just know of all the health effects. I'm happy for other people to go. <laughs> I'm not that eager to sign up. I think a little bit more time would be required for me to uh, 
be convinced to go there, let's say that, <laughs> especially to pick up Neil Armstrong's nappies. Well, I think one place that you would love to go uh, is the Red Planet. Um, although maybe not with the stench coming out of the place. <laughs> they found methane o- on Mars, or it's finally been confirmed, the long-held uh, speculation. That's right. So, you know, there's been hints that there's been the seasonal variations in methane, uh, and now it's kind of agreed and conclusive from multiple studies and probes that, yes, there is not only methane coming out of Mars, but it varies with seasons, and this is a big deal. It's not that there's just a bit of gas release going on. It's that during the summer months, there's more methane than the winter months. Uh, And this is, again, another important thing. If we think about things on Earth, well, think cows, right? Cows are a big producer of methane. Uh, Living organisms are a big producer of methane. Just as if we want to see if there's variations in CO2 level, because, right, you know, we breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon dioxide. If there's variations in methane, it could be a sign that there's something there living, giving off that methane, and naturally it makes sense. If you're more active in summer, you might produce more. Less active in winter, produce less. Well, Brad, possibly Matt Groening uh, was correct in Futurama with the buggalo on Mars. There, there are all these Martian cows beneath the surface surviving <laughs> and producing all this methane. Look, you know, it, it is not out of the realm of question that that's what would happen. I would, I think it'd be interesting if there was a, um, a Martian cow let's say but again i think the cool thing about all of this is that it makes it exciting for this quest uh it gives us reason to go and land in these places go and look for it and that you know it's it's a simple idea that if we can understand human processes and go and look at it in space we can relate it to the things that we know here on earth just as we've done in geology and physics and biology now on living organisms and how they survive in space. And we do make all these jokes and, and keep it lighthearted, but it is, uh, you know, these are some significant scientific yeah. breakthroughs that, that, that we can make and we can learn about what's out there. That's right. I mean, the fact that we can potentially see there's something changing on Mars, whether geological or biological or both, that's important. It's not this red dead planet that even as early as probably 10 or 15 years ago we always viewed it as that is this is dynamic planet you know as we talked about last week about the water surviving on mars for a long time there is a lot to this neighboring planet and we're not even talking about the other things in our solar system this just Mm. happens to be the closest and so we've studied it in great detail because it's easy it's similar to earth and and has all these different features so it is you know, we are really starting to understand the place of the Earth in retrospect in comparison to everything else in the solar system and and the galaxy in the universe. Well, let's stretch out a little bit further and we're going to head over to Sagittarius A, or colloquially known as the centre of the galaxy, the supermassive black hole. Uh, And on Wednesday night Australian time, we're going to hopefully see something from over there. That's right. So it is scheduled to be released. Um, The first image from the Event Horizon Telescope of the supermassive black hole uh, in the center of our galaxy. And so this has been a project where they've linked radio telescopes all around the world to act as one giant Earth-bound telescope so they can resolve in great detail that center of the black hole or that center area where we think the black hole is. That image is slated to be released 11.07 11.07 Australian Eastern Time Wednesday, uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon in Berlin um, on Wednesday where the, the main press release is. The fact that we're getting this link of everything, um, of these telescopes, to actually see the image of this black hole in the center of our galaxy and actually be able to see a black hole, I think it's kind of amazing. And it's exciting that we're now able to potentially do this. We'll wait when it's released at 11.07 Australian Eastern Time on Wednesday night or 3 p.m. Berlin Wednesday. Um, Thursday's going to be an exciting day. Fantastic, Brad. Well, uh, we're going to take over the uh, the main show with the Talking Science special uh, on Thursday, special day, special time, with that image. Hopefully, we've got that image in our hands and we're going to have a look at that. Uh, but we're going to be up late uh, Wednesday night checking out the live stream uh, and then we'll uh, we'll phone in early on Thursday to, to bring that to Trek Zone. I'm very much looking forward to it because it, it's it's on par with these big discoveries, isn't it? The fact that you could think that we can image a black hole, like that's a pretty crazy thing to say. You know, and again, you would never thought that we'd be able to do anything remotely like this 10 years ago. Could they, in theory, just Photoshop 
um, some stars onto a black background and say, hey, look, it's a black <laughs> hole. It's, it's funny when people have talked about the jokes of what it could be like. In fact, there's some really cool things. In fact, we could just actually see the shadow of the black hole cast it onto the ne- neighboring stars. There's a lot of cool ways this can actually come out and look at it. They also pointed at the neighboring galaxy in, in M87 to look at the supermassive black hole there. So we could actually be seeing two. We could only be seeing one. We could actually see that the black hole is not a perfect circle. Einstein's theory of relativity says it should be a perfect circle. If it's not, that means relativity's wrong. So there's a lot of cool things that, you know, there's an anticipation that people are building up and there'll be a flurry of papers released on the day and even more so afterwards with people doing their own and satellite or uh, studies and interpretations and things like that. Fantastic, Brad. Well, looking forward to chatting to you on Thursday. You are very excited. I love it. I love it. I love a good black hole image. <laughs> Fantastic, Brad. Thanks for talking science. Yeah.